Good morning, dear parents. Parents online as well as offline, a warm welcome this morning. Thank you for taking the time uh, to participate in this important meeting. And I'm sure most of you know the reason why we are having this meeting with your parents. Uh, the purpose is, one thing is, uh, we would like to have our children back physically in school. So we want to talk about it. And then we also know that quite a few schools have already started offline classes. And we at Bethany will also want to do the same as soon as possible. And, uh, but <coughs> like, what we do in Bethany always, we want to take you into confidence, parents, and then you know discuss this with you, and then take it forward. But uh, I think uh, it's time that uh, we have our children back in school, uh, because from what we hear, even the COVID cases have come come down considerably. Considerably. So this morning, uh, we just want to uh, share this uh, some. Some of these uh, points with you, some of these uh, views that we have, some of the plans that we have for reopening of school. But before that, I request Mr. Chris Anandam, uh, a teacher from the high school, to say a word of prayer. Hi, everyone. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time, especially when the corona cases are very low. We pray that your wisdom will preside over this meeting, that we will take a decision which is favorable for each and every one, including the families of the children. We commit this meeting and the time into your hand. In Jesus' name, Amen. Good morning once again, everybody. And thank you for being with us here this morning. My pleasure to uh, introduce a few people who will be talking and answering questions that have been sent to us in advance. Um, first and foremost, we have Dr. Taha Mateen. He is the managing director at the Acura Hospital, and he's someone who is continuously mindful of the poverty and the other social injustices in Bangalore City. He is a guide and a mentor to numerous charitable and social projects in our city. Um, he is a great orator, a wonderful public speaker, but more important than all that, he's a, a very good friend of ours here in Bethany. And uh, about 10 days ago, when we had a meeting with him, he was very kind to come over to our school, to look at our, our classrooms, to look at uh, the infirmary that we have, to advise our, our nurses and the medical personnel that we have here in Bethany. And uh, this morning, uh, he has consented to be with us uh, and to address some of the questions and to also uh, give us some advice as to the, how, how we go forward in this uh, current scenario of ours. Um, he is also the director and managing trustee of HPS. That's a non-profitable charity hospital, hospital. And it's one of the biggest dialysis centers in the city. And uh, we have information about both these hospitals at any point in time. If any one of you uh, need help, do contact either Robert and me, and we'll be uh, more than happy to put you on to Dr. Mateen and to his capable team. Uh, during the first and the second wave, uh, he and the team played a very uh, important role in helping the city in, in more ways than one. So we're happy this morning that we have Dr. Mateen we're also happy to have um, Jennifer. Uh, most of you know Mrs. Jennifer Tavares. She's a counselor working with adults and adolescent uh, children. She also works with children with learning difficulties. And uh, both her children uh, studied uh, here in Bethany. One passed out and one still studies over here. So welcome, Jenny. And I uh, also want to welcome Dr. Srikant. Dr. Srikant is um, Consultant, he's a plastic reconstructive and cosmetic surgeon. So, if anyone of you all want a new face, you just have to go and meet Dr. Srikant. But thank you, he's a parent also, and uh, his daughter Niharika passed out of Bethany a couple of years ago, and he has a son over here in Bethany. So, welcome, three of you. Can you put your hands together for them, please? Um, I'm going to request Dr. Mateen to start the entire thing off, to set the tone, and to tell us exactly uh, how we can move forward. So, over to Dr. Mateen. 
A very good morning uh, to everybody, parents online, offline, staff, principal. We're here today after a long phase that we have all suffered from this tremendous surge of a illness that we have never ever seen before. This is kind of a once in a century uh, kind of thing we faced. Starting in China in December two years ago, 2019, and we had our first lockdown March of 2020, as you remember, just taking you through history in the recent past. And then in our own city of Bangalore, it stuck the end of June, the first week of July. We all remember those terrible, terrible times when we were not able to provide oxygen to people. People were not able to touch each other. We were quarantined, and if anybody got it, the whole house and the whole block would get quarantined. These were times of the unknown. We didn't know what it was at that time. We didn't know how to face it. We did not know the do's and don'ts of this disease. It was so bad that I remember There's a young couple, father and mother, whose child, 17 day old, died, and it wasn't COVID. And they handed it over in a box, in a, in, a, in a carry bag, and gave it to us, said, you go and cremate this baby. It was a very painful thing. The, the point I'm trying to make is, there was a lot of unknown. We didn't know what to do, and we did terrible things at that time. And then the first wave hit us last year, all the way from July to December, and we all ended and we thought it was all over, and um, um, the government made an announcement that we finally captured it or, uh, you know, conquered COVID. But the second wave came to us rather early, in, uh, in, in May of 21. That was good for us actually because May and June it hit us first and then went to all the other countries, the Delta variant uh, or so as we call it, we call it the Indian variant to begin with. However, after that May and June interim when we had this terrible, terrible um, um, uh, deaths, I lost a cousin sister of mine who was younger than me, I lost my accountant, I lost a business partner, I lost innumerable number of friends and so many patients. I've treated more than 1,500 of very, very, very sick COVID patients. It's been one of the most devastating um, feelings that I have ever gone through, seeing death upon death. Progress. Continuously people dying, it's very, very difficult to see. However, things have gotten better. You know, after June, we've been free of COVID. The economy has opened up, the roads have opened up, people are back on the streets. And what are we seeing now in hospitals? Very, very little. And it's time now to address a very, very critical question that we are all here today to discuss, understand, and take our next steps carefully and with absolute safety. And that is the question of our children going back to school. I think it's time that we have a serious discussion on that. Many schools have opened. Our children have suffered enough being cooped up at home in front of computers, not having had the uh, normal phase of life and you interact with children and you move and, 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 and that adds to uh, the uh, overall holistic development of a child. I think it's time that we discuss that today. Um, I congratulate um, uh, Mr. Akash Rayal and his team for organizing this uh, and let's see um, what the questions are so that we can take our steps in calculated manners in the best interest of the children, their safety and their well-being should be foremost and a priority uh, in a in a overall way. Um, so let's begin the discussion. Thank you very much. Bye. Good morning uh, to all the parents who are watching it here as well as online. 
uh, we did an orientation program at the beginning of the year where we spoke about red flags, behavioral red flags that parents could observe in their children because at that point of time the second wave had hit us very hard. And over the last few months, uh, things seem to have settled down and all that we hear from children when we enter classrooms or when they come to me for counselling, even the school counsellor has said the same, that when are we going to go back to school? And I think the cry for help is coming from our children to return back to school so that normalcy starts. Every day there is something in the paper that exams are announced, then exams are cancelled, exams are postponed, and these children have a lot of uncertainty uh, that they are facing. So in order to reduce that uncertainty, coming to school, their friends are their oxygen, letting them mingle with their friends, and so on. And one of the suggestions given by experts about children returning back to school is that if they ha are in a routine, we can see a lot of anxiety being reduced. We will also be able to see better mental health, a reduction of behavioral addictions such as internet addiction, pornography, uh, some of us have gone into shopping addictions. These are all the behavioral addictions which do not involve a substance and therefore sometimes we think it's okay if they are addicted to this. But any addiction is not good and the first uh, step that the school is taking to, to introduce the normalcy into children's lives is to come back to school. So if you all have any questions related to mental health, you could put it in the chat box and we will answer some of the questions. But I think the first step is to reduce the uh, your anxiety surrounding the medical reasons why children shouldn't return to school and so we'll take those questions first and then come in for the mental health part. I'm sorry, I'm going to ask Dr. Srikant to say a few words before we start and uh, uh, soon after that uh, we'll request the panel to sit up there. Come Dr. Srikant. Uh, hello. Uh, good morning. morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Bethany to, for taking this initiative because I'm not aware of any other school which has done this. So I think they all deserve a big hand for involving all of us parents <laughs> for, to have a discussion about COVID. Now, I'm sure all of you know about COVID. Everything is there in your WhatsApp university, is there on the news, it's there in the papers, it's there everywhere. I'll try to crystallize a few points of what we know. We don't know too much, first of all. We don't know too much. But what we know are a few things. One, it is extremely infective. Two, if you get infected, the chances of you falling sick is very small. Three, if you get sick, unlike last year and the uh, beginning of COVID, we have ways and means to approach it. Maybe not the most ideal of uh, treatments, but we have ways and means to treat it. So the first thing that all of you have to understand is COVID is devastating, but at the same time, it is the chance of you falling very sick is extremely small. If you take a percentage of people who get COVID and the people who go to a hospital, the people who go to uh, get admitted for more than three to five days, people who go into the ICU, and finally probably require you know something very major like a ventilator or like more dollars, very 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 small. So who get it? Diabetics, hypertensive immunocompromised. These are the three main categories of people who will have a problem with COVID. So, and the second thing is that whether children will get it. Now, few facts I'm going to put it across to you. You can of course come back to the same questions again when you come to the question and answer. First thing, world over, children are less infective. Children don't get COVID that frequently as adults. Two reasons. One is that they feel that during the young age, we all get a lot of cough, cold, fever. A lot of it is to do with adenovirus, which is the same family as the COVID. And there is some amount of cross immunity which builds up. And that is to a very high extent as we are kids. The second thing that is thought to be is because in the children, the, the virus needs a portal of entry. That means it needs a gate. The gate is usually a ACE receptor which is expressed in the nose and in the pharynx, that is the nasopharynx region, that is the upper airway. Those, these ACE, inhibitor, ACE receptors are not well expressed in children. That is one of the difference between children and adults. Adults have more ACE receptors in the nasopharyngeal region, 
children have less. So the chances of a child getting COVID with a mild exposure is very less. That means to say the child has to have a exposure to a huge viral load to get infected. So these two things tell us that the children are generally safe. Where is the data coming from? It is coming from all across Europe, where they have, in fact, I think uh, they have uh, Denmark, Sweden, all the Scandinavian countries have opened their schools much way, almost a year, year and a half ago. And they seem to, we have a lot of data with them and then that tells us that children are not very highly infected. Then, the third thing is, what about the family members? Because children come home, we have uh, parents, grandparents, in-laws, uncles, aunties, some of us live in a joint family. What about them? For them, we all need to take a precaution. So, precaution, right now we have a very good answer, that is get vaccinated. All the people in the family, everybody who comes in contact with the children, that is the family members, the servants, your drivers, your help, your partner, encourage everybody to be vaccinated. Vaccination is free, it is available all across. I think it's just, you need a telephone number and an Aadhaar card, you can get yourself vaccinated. From the school point of view, which we discussed with uh, uh, Dr. Akash and Dr. Mr. Kin earlier, is that make sure that all the staff in the school should be vaccinated. That is, right from the director onwards, right up to the last gardener and their families. We should encourage them to get vaccinated, make sure that they are all vaccinated. So once you are vaccinated, what we have seen, especially in the data in Manipal Hospital, is that if you are vaccinated, the chance of you getting hospitalized is almost zero. That is what we have seen during the second wave. That all the people who came into admission during the second wave, the people who are not vaccinated or partially vaccinated, a very, 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 very few handful of people with both doses of vaccination needed hospitalization. I am not really sure of the numbers. It must be close to five or seven of all the people that we have admitted. So it's an extremely small number. And therefore, vaccination works and vaccination protects everybody. So if we take all this, I feel that the children will be safe. And like it was mentioned before, children now are going through an extremely difficult mental phase. They may not be able to articulate so clearly. And we also as parents have got into a phase that, you know, it's okay for them to sit cooped up at home within four walls. It is literally like a jail for them. And same thing day upon day, day upon day, day upon day. I don't think it is healthy for them because humans are meant to act, interact socially. This is the growing phase of their life. This is when they meet people, talk, get, uh, you know, their social skills sharpened, so to say. And we are denying them if we do not allow them to come to school. So I feel that we should open up the school. And uh, if your people have any questions about the medical part, I'm happy to answer. Hello everyone, uh, yeah, uh, as part of the survey and as part of the online Zoom session, we have collated some questions. Uh, children with uh, respiratory ailments like asthma or wheezing, uh, is it safe for them to come back? Even if, uh, if you would say a child in normal health, even if they do uh, get an infection, they will uh, shrug it off easily. Are children with wheezing and other respiratory diseases uh, at more risk? Uh, hello? Yes. Uh, children with respiratory illnesses, yes, are slightly at a higher risk. Not from the point of view of getting COVID, but in the point of view of getting tested frequently. Because we do not know whether the attack of cough or throat irritation or runny nose is because of the allergy or is it because of a COVID infection. So what happens is that probably they will be tested more frequently than the other children. But whether they will deteriorate with COVID, unlikely, unless they have a very severe uh, you know, lung condition which is compromises the lung, not asthma, but something like interstitial fibrosis or something else like that. But otherwise, the chances of children going into getting COVID is less, but if they do get COVID, yes, the, them expressing uh, you know, respiratory symptoms like having cough, needing hospitalization, probably is higher than the other children. Uh, then leading on from that, uh, what symptoms uh, should lead to what investigations? In a normal course of event, you would say, okay, a cold is going to last you a week. 
in this uh, scenario where the school will encourage people with symptoms or even mild symptoms not to come back to school, what should be the protocol? Like if a cold is there for three days, then you go to the doctor or what? Well, if you have a cold, don't send your child to school. I don't think it is right. None of us like to work. If you have a heavy head, a stuffy nose or a headache, you send them to school. This is even without COVID, I feel. If your child is not well, please keep him at home. They require TLC, that is tender loving care, and not the school. So, if the child has any, if the child is feeling ill, why do you want to send them to school? I mean, beats logic. That is the first thing. Now the question is, what the other corollary to that is, if somebody at home is ill, then should you send the child to school? That is a difficult question to answer. It's common sense to say that the whoever is ill with the parents or grandparents, isolate yourself till you get yourself tested or till you're cleared medically that you don't have COVID. Uh, I think that would be the one of the things that parents should understand that if you live in a large family, somebody in the family has got a cough cold fever, get them tested and if you feel that you know they are if you want to wait till the COVID test report comes back, don't send the child to school. I think we should just say don't send the child to school. Don't send the child to school. Somebody in the home is ill till you are cleared medically. And also, uh, yeah. um, the advice that I have dished out to both adults as well as children is don't get tested. As soon as you get a fever or a cold and a cough, you just don't rush and get yourself tested. Rather, you know, it's usually said that a cold and cough lasts a week if you go to a doctor or seven days if you don't. So, treat it like a common cold and a cough. Don't get super anxious just because your child had cold and cough, whether it's a child or an adult. It's a, it's a common cold and a cough. And, 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 and therefore, for the first one, two, three, four days, you don't do nothing. Other than the usual cold and cough medicines and the fever medicines, you feel good. And, 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 and certainly, certainly, please don't send that child to school. That child should not. So the parents are the first gatekeepers. And then I'm sure there's going to be a gatekeeper here, you know, checking. Uh, um, temperature uh, and maybe a little bit of nose too. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we had a teacher who used to check our haircut um, uh, at the entry point. Everybody had to be disciplined. So, so there's going to be another gatekeeper there. Then there's a teacher who's going to pick up and then say, uh, you know, if you're sick, don't go. We got to be a little more sensitive about it than normal times. Uh, uh, that's how we treat it. And number two. Respiratory illnesses can be of several types. There are some rare types of very severe respiratory illnesses, which, which we are not talking about. Those are extremes. But the regular respiratory illnesses that children have is allergic rhinitis. That's not a risk for COVID. That's normal. So let's go. Uh, huh? Um, just want to say that we'll have a holding day uh, in case a child falls ill during school hours and we'll immediately call the parents but the child will be isolated with our nurses and uh, we'll take care. The next uh, set of questions are about uh, vaccination for children. It was in the news some time back that vaccinations have been approved for ages 14 and up but they have not yet come to the market. Uh, is anything known about uh, side effects of vaccinations uh, for, in children? Well, uh, what has been approved is Zytus Candida and that has passed phase 3 trials. Phase 3 trials means it is safe, right? That is the first and the foremost thing. There are very many criteria which the uh, WHO and the ICMR and all this uh, pediatricians association have to say that this vaccination is safe, this has got this many X, Y, Z side effects. So when you clear space three trials, that, that this clear clearance happened before the government had approved Zytus Candida. That means say, all these questions have been answered. Is it safe? Does it have side reactions? Is the side reactions bad? Is it going to cause permanent damage? All that. So 
There are different kinds of uh, levels for a clinical trial, phase 1, phase 2, phase 3. When it has crossed phase 3, only then would the government accept the application to see that yes, can be used. So far, Zyla's Cadilla has done its, uh, has uh, crossed the finish line. And when will it come? Depends on how fast the company can, I mean, the company can manufacture and supply those doses. That I think uh, none of them know the answer except the government and the manufacturer themselves. Uh, another question was, uh, would you say children uh, from exposure to others in the family who got COVID have uh, uh, developed antibodies by now? Has any testing been done for that? Yes. The answer to the question is yes. That is what is a zero survey. The zero survey has been done in very many parts, probably Delhi, some, say, some in Chennai. But those are extremely, extremely, extremely small. And their data suggests 67 percent immunity. I'm not sure how to interpret that reason because it is such a fraction you cannot apply to our entire country or even an entire population like Bangalore. Because if you test 600 people, then that is not an actual survey. But what the, that, that says is that people who have been in the community long enough have a 67 percent chance of having antibodies without getting COVID. Means to say that if you have been in this COVID situation for so many months. If you test 100 people, 67 percent of them will have antibodies. So that's no reason to try to avoid the vaccination. You must take the vaccination. Nobody should avoid the vaccination. I mean, it is it beats logic why you would want to avoid, uh, avoid vaccination. To put it in monetary terms, you save on the person. If you get a little more severity, then the next step is you may get hospitalized. So you save on the hospitalization. If you get hospitalized, you may go into an ICU. You save that ICU money. If you go into the ICU, you may go on a ventilator, so you save that much more. And some people on the ventilator will go on an ECMO, which is even more expensive. And finally, the, the last phase of that is to get a lung transplant. You save all these finances, right from 600 rupees, right up to 2 crores, which is the cost of a lung transplant, by taking a, a simple jab. I think the vaccination, is, if it is now available free of cost, in, in the private hospital, it's cost about 1,250 or so. So two doses is 2,500. I think it is worth the prevention. No, they won't. What they do, they ask you to sit there for about 45 minutes to see if there is any idea. The other question is, uh, some of these children are still undergoing regular immunizations as part of the childhood immunization schedule. Is there supposed to be some gap between, uh, is, there, is timing important between taking a COVID vaccination and the regular one? Well, there's nothing fixed like that. COVID vaccination should not interfere with regular vaccinations. You know, regular vaccinations are not that many in number that, uh, you know, they're not cluttered together. So you would give at least a week or two gap between each uh, vaccination. So you should give a little gap, but um, 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 that's not much of an issue actually. Um, there have been questions about uh, cases increasing in, the, in Europe, Russia and China. News reports would suggest that that is in the unvaccinated uh, population. Uh, is that likely to, how is that likely to impact India? I mean, not just from the point of view of children, but from... Yeah. Those data, the only way you can interpret it in India is to say that those who few who have not got vaccinated and are at a higher risk of getting COVID. For whatever reason, if you have missed your vaccination or if you have not completed the vaccination, that means that you are at a slightly higher risk of getting COVID. And uh, that is the way to look at the data which is coming in. Uh, Directly applying Europe and Russian uh, data right now to India, I don't think we can extrapolate like that because our vaccination rates are different. One, second thing is our immune pattern is slightly different from the developed country. We are, slight, we are quite immune to a lot of other things as compared to the people who lived in the West all their lives. You would have noticed in your friends and family when they come to travel to India, if they eat out, they then the next few days they'll be running to the bathroom in and out. It is not their fault, it is not their fault because they are exposed to such a clean environment that their body has forgotten how to tackle the local germs that we all are used to day in and day out. So it is 
a side effect of their obsessive cleanliness. So, as far as Indians are concerned, our immunity is slightly higher. And in fact, there was one, at one time I remember there was a theory which said that that is why probably Indians are not going to get the second wave. Of course, they all got trash when the second wave hit us. Um, there are questions about, uh, I mean, despite best efforts, there is only a certain amount of social distancing that is going to be possible in public spaces, especially schools. And even in uh, uh, regular public places now, I don't think social distancing is being maintained. The masking is being uh, maintained. Uh, so you would say that uh, that is enough, the emotional benefits of coming back to school with, without, with only minimal social distancing but wearing a mask and sanitizing is overpoweringly good for the children. Uh, I, I mean, even if we cannot do social distancing to the extent that was originally prescribed, we will insist on masks, we will do temperature checks and uh, the sanitizer. But the benefits of this, or whatever little risk this involves, is outweighed by the... I think it far outweighs what's happening right now. And uh, in a school like Bethany, uh, I want to be honest and tell the parents, I don't know how much of social distancing we can do, especially in the classrooms. Uh, there are countries, neighbor countries like Dubai, where school has started, the government has just said there will not be any more online classes. And everybody are going to school, right? From the tiny tots to the 12th graders. Uh, they're sitting in a class. I visited three schools. Um, Dubai Heights International School, uh, Founders International, and uh, the Indian uh, Gulf, Gulf Indian School near Garud. And all these schools were open, all the children were there, and uh, 35, 40 children sitting in the classroom. Uh, there was no social distancing. Everybody had their masks on. They were all tested when they walked into school, and uh, there was sanitizing. There was sanitizing. So uh, if we start, that's how it will be here, Bethany. And if you go by news reports, which I generally don't, they have said that masks in the US have helped in reducing the COVID spread by 50%. Uh, Dr. Mateen, this yeah. is for you. Children with uh, diabetes, uh, any special precautions for them? Well, certainly children with diabetes are at higher risk in case they get COVID. Um, those we got to be super careful because their immune systems are much uh, weaker than the general population. So if there is a juvenile diabetic in the school, he would require special counseling and we'll see what we can do with that child. Uh, maybe try to get the child immunized uh, ASAP and uh, do that and take extra precautions for the child. See, the, basically what we are looking here Nobody can guarantee 100% absoluteness about anything. There's no guarantee about my life, you know, when you go out into the city in the, in the traffic, what's going to happen next? So there's no guarantees in life. 100% certainties are not what we work on. However, so we, 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 we always balance the risks and the benefits of what we do, whether you take a vaccination. There's no 100% guarantee that vaccinations are good for you. There are a lot of side effects, there are a lot of clotting events that are happening, uh, known, uh, recorded, and unrecorded. And therefore, there's no 100% guarantee about a medicine like brufen or some pain medicine. It can kill you for all you care. And therefore, when you look at the risks and the benefits, the achievement gaps that kids are going to have by not coming to school are going to permanently damage their psyche and uh, people, uh, education, educationists are interestingly calling the achievement gaps can become achievement chasms, you know, huge as you grow older and older. That little bit that you gave up is not going to be good for you. And therefore, if you look at data-driven societies, Denmark, for example, Britain and, and, and the UK, they opened up schools. I mean, they opened up last year. And then only threw away intermittently kind of closed up in small locales. Otherwise, the schools are open. 
Therefore, you need to look at the broader picture. Of course, uh, when, when, when Denmark opened uh, last year in, 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 in August, they said, are you treating our kids like guinea pigs? The parents, naturally the parents are apprehensive about it. But when you look at data as a whole, and then there's an interesting thing. Parents are going out to restaurants, they are having food, they are everything, and they are enjoying a steak and a drink, perhaps in Cornwall. You don't want your kids to go to school. And that's extremely discriminatory. That is wrong. I mean, like, what are we talking about? You know, the parents are not sitting cooped up at home all the time, and they're not going out strictly for business. And therefore, let's have a balanced view. Of course, we love our children. And uh, there's a study in the UK. Out of two million children, one, uh, rather two percent, two in a million gets affected. Two in a million children gets affected, not mortality. And that's the uh, numbers uh, that we see amongst children. It's exceptionally low. And in, 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 in having a reaction like this, that you're not going to, uh, you're going to interfere with a child's normal growth and education and his friends is not going to be fair. Uh, and, 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 and therefore, uh, if you look at uh, several magazines, Nature, for example, um, the, the data that they give out across the world, and, and this question that you asked earlier, Jaya, about the uh, number of people getting uh, uh, zero positive without getting COVID. Um, like Dr. Srikant said, two-thirds of our children, 67% are already uh, zero positive. They have antibodies against uh, this. And the interesting thing is parents at home should be vaccinated first before they ask about children getting vaccinated. Parents at home should get vaccinated first, and that should be a criteria. So let the parents get vaccinated. And that, see, in the early days, the children were not sent to school. Why? Not because they were at risk for COVID themselves. Because they were thought to be carriers of COVID to their grandparents. That was the reason why the schools were stopped. Not because they were getting COVID and everybody was dying. Because they could be carriers. They could take COVID back home and elderly people at home uh, get at risk. So schools were shut down. Let us understand that very clearly. It wasn't to prevent COVID in children primarily. So now that the adults have been by and large vaccinated, at least in the city, at least in the, uh, the, 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 the population that we are talking to, the risks have come down significantly. Children, very little. Uh, and therefore, uh, let's take that uh, step and be data-driven and not uh, emotional about this and not cause permanent irrevocable damage to our children. And that's a very serious matter. Thank you. Um, well, there's one question about uh, protocols, like uh, if a child or uh, a family member of a child who has come to school tests positive, uh, what are the government approved protocols for the other children? Like if in child class 6A, there is a, either a child or the child's family has tested positive, what should be the school's protocol? Yeah. See, if somebody in the child's family tests positive, the government is very clear, the child is a primary contact. The primary contact along with the patient should be isolated. Now the duration of isolation for the patient is 17 days. It has come down to 14 and it may come down to 10. For the primary contact that is the child, they are expected to be quarantined for a period of 7 days after which they are tested. If they are negative, they can come out. That is the rule as of today. It may change. May be brought down to five days, which is what our pulmonologists tell us, but it has not been brought down. It is seven days from the day that the person is declared as a primary contact. For example, if I get my COVID positive report today, my child is a primary contact, I isolate myself, my house is fully quarantined. On the seventh day, if my child wants to go out, he needs to be tested and only then he will be allowed outside. But for the class, your child was in for the nothing, at, nothing all. at all for that. That they are all considered, like they are not considered as contacts. Okay. Unless the child is positive. If the child is positive, then the scenario is different. Okay. What would the scenario be then? Uh, what would the scenario be if a child tests positive? If the child tests positive, then everybody in the class should watch out for symptoms and test as soon as they get. Uh, they feel that they have uh, symptoms of COVID, like 
cough, fever, extreme fatigue, breathlessness, and in a small percentage, that is about 10% of the COVID patients present with diarrhea. So, from the school's perspective, uh, we should close the classroom down then. There's an interesting question here about using school transport. Many of us have already traveled on the flight, you know, when you go out in the planes, they take all those precautions and then those, in a, in a closed atmosphere for two, three, four hours, when you go to Delhi, two and a half hours, uh, you're, you're cooped up in a plane. There's certain things, the biggest barrier to COVID is a mask. And, 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 and let all children wear masks and there should be somebody on the bus that enforces this strictly. And once you have a mask, travel internationally is allowed. I don't know why Bethany should be out of uh, the earth for this. And, and, and therefore, please wear your masks and, 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 and travel to school. Uh, the best way is to use the school transport. Srikanth, if you have anything. Uh, the only thing about using school transport is that, yes, it is perfectly all right because these are not air conditioned, all windows can be kept open. And reduce standing, that is overcrowding of the buses. So, those of you who don't use the school transport, who take private transport, you would see that you know, children are packed and packed into this because. For obviously, for monetary reasons, the guy fills them with 20 kids where only 5 kids should be sitting. Those things, I think, should be avoided. If you are sending your uh, kid to a non Bethany transport, that is the smaller vans, speak to the van driver, tell him that you cannot take more than X number of people. There is a guideline given by the government. I think sitting plus two standing or something like that. I am not too very clear about it. But there is a guideline saying that how many people can come in a bus of a certain size. Previously, the rule by the government was no standing allowed. Now they are allowing standing passengers. I think ten or twelve. We don't have any standing. standing in school transport is should be okay. Everyone has a seat. Um, there is a question about uh, how long. Uh, uh, I mean, should can one mask be worn uh, safely? How long should uh, should the children be encouraged to change it <laughs> during the school day? Wash your mask frequently. First and the foremost, wash your mask. I wash my mask four to six times a day. So if you are not doing it, please do. Spit, smells, saliva, smells, cough, sneeze, everything that we do into the mask after about a couple of hours, smell. So wash your mask frequently. A mask, if it is a cloth mask, it can be reused, it is not very protective. If it is an N95, you go into a place like a hospital where you are treating patients uh, or seeing patients who are potentially infected with COVID or you are going to visit a relative in the hospital or something. Discard the mask as you leave the building. And uh, other masks, you can uh, reuse them for, I mean, use one mask for the entire day if it's a disposable mask. So, the school walk is there, but if it's wearing. Cloth mask is good. Uh, regular mask is Regular mask is good. The rest of them are extremely uncomfortable. But please wash the kids' masks. Every day. Wash them uh, every single day when they come. Give them about two or three masks and kids drop masks. So, send a spare mask to the bag. Yeah. Good morning, family. I just want to know, the school's going to open in January, I think, and I hope, fingers crossed. I just want to know from the doctors and uh, from uh, Dr. Ryan and Ms. Kim, um, would you be having a, a drill for the students to run at least once, I mean, all the class classes, because I, I think it would be good for the lungs to be opened out. I mean, is it, would they be running on the field at least once? Sports being organized or something? Sports, you mean? Yes. I mean, would it be a good thing to get the children to run on the field at least once a day? All classes. Would it help in any way? I thought they had sports period every day. We have PE. PE. So that will be enforced, right? I assume it's going to be on. Yes. Okay. Thank you. There is a question here about uh, wearing masks for long periods of time. Will it cause any problems in the oxygen level? No. Uh, I think all other questions are variations of the ground that's been covered. So we will close questions now. And. Uh, the protocols about uh, 
starting school and all will be communicated uh, by the school directly. I think the medical panel has to leave. Yeah. There was a question uh, about cafeteria. What the hospital follows is put this uh, plexiglass barriers between if you have a table. If you don't have a table, they're sitting outside a meeting, let them carry the food outside and keep more dustbins in place, you know, so that they kids may, may not throw their wrappers and uh, things. So spread it out across the entire ground or at least halfway to the ground and somebody to monitor the social distancing. If you have a table and a chair, uh, plexiglass in between is there. I can send a photograph of what we have in our hospital fancy. Uh, it works well, easy to clean, use. Um, Jennifer hasn't spoken and she has something to say, but do you have a question to ask her? Yes. Um, one of the parents has asked, um, can you please check if the school can arrange for the vaccination of children in the school? When, when that happens, absolutely. We, whenever that comes up, we can do that. We had a vaccination drive, uh, in fact, twice where we got all our staff members, uh, uh, we opened it up to parents and uh, other friends and I think the first one was free, the, the first one was I think, paid for but it was compromised and the second one they had to pay for. But we've done that in Bethany and uh, we'll certainly do that again once the vaccination comes out and it's uh, verified that, that it's safe for the children, we will we'll do that. I think a lot of medical facts have been put across this morning and I I think the first step to reducing our anxiety is to know the facts. So as parents, I think we have to communicate this constantly to our children to reduce their anxiety if they have anything. Uh, many years ago I worked, uh, I was an, I am still, I still say I'm a nurse, but I worked with HIV uh, programs where we created awareness to reduce the fear among people. So I think what we've attempted to do today is an awareness program through questions to reduce everyone's fear, teachers, students, parents, etc. However, parents, if any of your children are still, you know, you feel they are displaying signs of anxiety of returning back to school or if they have suffered any loss uh, of a loved one, do let the counsellors know uh, or do let your HODs know and we will get in touch with these children and I, you've been probably noticed I've been uh, writing down all the points because uh, education, health education, continuous health education to allay fear is very important. So from the school end, I think we'll do this continuously uh, with teachers and students so that everyone comes back to school. Some fear is good so that they will wear their masks and take precautions, but extreme fear will lead to anxiety and other phobias which we don't want. So another question that came in and I'll leave it to Dr. Martin to answer this one. Um, what steps do the children take once they reach back home? See, generally when we didn't know much about COVID, we really, really invested into sanitizers and stuff and we thought this could get transmitted by touch. And so we kept scrubbing our tabletops and everything and handles and uh, I live in an apartment complex where they're still using toothpicks to press the um, right, uh, the, <laughs> the uh, um, buttons on the left. So uh, that is passing I and mean, that's gone. And therefore, while hand hygiene, cleaning up, so as soon as a child comes up, you wash your hand, you wash your face, and I think that's a general advice that we should follow and that, that, that that's very, very important that that kind of cleanliness is ensured at home and that. But to be obsessive about it and think that it's all going to be by touch, you brought something from school, so to teach a, treat a child like an untouchable is not the right thing to do. Um, so don't be overly um, apprehensive about it. However, when a child comes back from school, and, 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 and it happens with even the adults do that too. You come back from the outside, you wash up, and the child children also wash up. I think that's a fair amount of precaution uh, to take uh, when the child comes back from school. The remaining questions are all about uh, logistics, when will school reopen, how many uh, days of the week, timing and all. For that, the school is still working out those and we will be in touch as soon as we have something definite. We, we will give a month's, uh, a month's notice uh, 
Uh, we will definitely inform the parents uh, well in advance as to the instructions, details, the date, the month, uh, as to when we are going to have these offline classes. Okay, so uh, my pleasant duty to thank Dr. Mathin, thank Dr. Srikant for being with us this morning, Jennifer, thank you so much, Jaya, you too, and uh, your parents who joined us here, and uh, the ones online. Um, just to, to sum up, I'm going to tell you this. The whole idea of doing this was for you people to hear it from the medical fraternity, that it is safe for the children to come back. Uh, we were one of the first schools that closed. And we're going to be one of the, the last schools that reopened uh, because we always have the child in, in mind. And uh, every day, I think we are bombarded with questions. I know the principal gets a whole lot of mail saying, um, when are we going to start? Why haven't we started? Other schools have started. It's all fine. The children who are going to other schools, nothing has happened. So we have been, I think, abundantly cautious. And uh, we said, uh, in January, we will let you know. It will be high school and junior college, most probably, that will start first. We have to start at some point in time, and that's why in Jan we said we'll start with high school, junior college, and then slowly break it down to middle school, primary, and pre-primary uh, as, as the days uh, go. All right? Um, you can contact uh, Nigel to find out about books and uniforms and shoes and so on and so forth, because when they come to school, they'll come in their full uniform. All right? And, um, there's one more thing that I just want to tell you. You will hear, even after today, lots of news on WhatsApp and uh, the various other social media platforms. Please quote what Dr. Mateen, what Dr. Srikant and what Mrs. Jennifer Tavares has told you this morning. Because that's the truth. You've heard it from the horse's mouth. Okay? You don't have to rely on, on uh, fear-mongering and fake news and so on and so forth. All right. So parents, we're looking forward to having the children with us. It's abnormal. Uh, two years they've been sitting at home, cooped up in that room, looking at the even the, the kids who who are uh, keen on on the academics and uh, are, are getting fed up. So I think enough is enough. We will take abundant precaution. Uh, all our staff members are vaccinated. If anyone's not. We will see that they are vaccinated. All the employees, the drivers, their families, our pupils, our helpers, our maids, all of them uh, will be back fully vaccinated. And uh, all the other protocols and SOPs that the government lays down will be followed. Uh, you can have Robert and my assurance on that count. All right. So thank you once again. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you very much for being with us this morning. Thank you all.